Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Healing Outside the Box. I'm Jean Tiberio, and I'm a nutritionist and a wellness coach. Today is episode 171, and today I'm bringing you the cliff notes of the Food Revolution Summit. Now, this summit is happening right now, over several days. So basically, I listened to several hours of one expert after another, so you won't have to. And you're welcome. But seriously, it's been very interesting. What I'm bringing you today is the not altogether shocking recap of what they're basically saying. With the exception of the Mediterranean versus Paleo camp, most experts are in agreement about the basic ideas on what's going wrong with our diet and what we can do to fix it. I'm going to focus on dietary recommendations for Alzheimer's disease because I thought that this was perhaps the most exciting news of the past few days. If I see anything else coming up regarding, say, weight loss or general health topics, I'll do another podcast about it next week. So here we go. Just as a side note, I did a four-part series on natural or alternative treatments for Alzheimer's disease, and perhaps I should say possible treatments, because none of these suggestions have been proven. The episodes I'm referring to are 158, 159, 160, and 161. I haven't settled on whether to call it natural or alternative treatments because there are no real mainstream medication or treatment right now that works beautifully. So I guess since the alternative to a mainstream treatment doesn't exist and the mainstream treatment doesn't exist, Perhaps the alternative is buying a set of rosary beads. But hold on a minute. Well, you can go ahead and buy the rosary beads and come back, because you may want to listen to those four episodes, and feel free to do that first. While listening to their three experts on Alzheimer's disease, I noticed that the experts are saying that when discussing risk, there may be actually 10 or 12 contributing factors, not just one or two. In other words, It's like cancer that way. And in one of those four episodes, I went over the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. First, let's get a few of the non-food items out of the way. And of course, the first is genetics. If you're interested in learning more about whether or not you may be genetically predisposed to getting Alzheimer's, there's a website for more information. It's basically apoe4.net and I'll give you a specific link in the show notes. The other thing that the experts make clear is that it's not just about getting old. All of those blue zone people and the 100-year-old people that get autopsies after they pass have a much lower incidence of Alzheimer's. If you're not familiar with blue zones and you'd like to know more about that, I've got an episode on the blue zones, and I'll link it in the show notes. Now, in one of the four episodes on Alzheimer's disease, I mentioned that when it comes to preventing or controlling AD, there are four big things you can do. Number one, improve your diet. Number two, exercise. And they say both aerobic exercise and strength training are both good. Number three, adequate sleep. And I know it's not cool to say I must get adequate sleep tonight. Woody Allen used to say in one of his movies, I'm a basket case unless I get my 14 hours of sleep every night. But it is very important if you want to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And ditto for number four, which is stress reduction. Now, in terms of eating the right foods to hedge your bets against Alzheimer's disease, maybe the best approach here is just to list the foods and then maybe get into some details as we go along, depending on if it's necessary or if I happen to know them. So number one is cruciferous vegetables. I love that word, cruciferous. Sounds like something the cowardly lion said in The Wizard of Oz. They can be called cruciferols, I suppose. And when most people mention this word, they think of broccoli or bok choy. And then people say, oh yeah, some of the other cruciferous vegetables are not as common or as popular. I'm going to mention a few of them in three categories. In the broccoli category, we have broccoli, what a surprise, Chinese broccoli, broccoli rabe, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, 
green cabbage, red cabbage, Chinese cabbage, and all the cabbages I forgot to mention. Of course, these vegetables are all low in calories. A cup of broccoli, for instance, is only about 50 calories. Then we have the leafy green cruciferous vegetables. They are your, well, greens. Collard greens, mustard greens, kale, bok choy. I happen to be on a bok choy kick, and it's actually a cool thing to add to almost any stir fry. Swiss chard and watercress. Not a fan of those. The third category in the cruciferous group are root vegetables, and they are turnips, radishes, and say rutabaga. There's a couple of things I'd like to mention about these vegetables. One expert mentioned that there's a study out now suggesting they may also help with autism. That's very interesting. Stay tuned for more. The second thing they mentioned is that broccoli pills just don't work. They're not sure why yet, but they just don't. I'm guessing that the inclusion of fiber in the actual whole plant might be one of the reasons. Number two, your basic onions, garlic, and mushrooms. The things that most cooks like to throw into the pot to start off their stir fries. By the way, in terms of fruits and vegetables, the recommendation for everyone is pretty much five servings a day. Here's the deal up with that. It doesn't have to be five different ones. The vegetables that I've mentioned are already so low in calories that you can afford to eat a heaping helping of them. Oh, just another note, with berries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, etc., I would definitely get the organic. Number three, blueberries gets its own category. But you can also include raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries on this list. Again, get the organic because the farmers spray the actual edible portion of the fruit and it concentrates in the berry. Number four, seeds. Now these are helpful to prevent or control Alzheimer's disease for a couple of reasons. But one of them is that they're high in vitamin E, which is an antioxidant. The antioxidants in the above mentioned foods will cut down on oxidation, thus the name. The experts in the webinar were talking about how important it is to cut down on inflammation to reduce your risk of AD. And remember, they're talking about inflammation in the brain, which is apparently a thing. By the way, seeds also make a good snack. For example, sunflower seeds that my Boston Red Sox players like to chew on in the dugout. And they're going to be my team until they start playing crappy, and then it'll be somebody else's problem. Number five is beans. In this category, we also include lentils, split peas, and soybeans. There have been a few studies suggesting that beans may help against cancer as well. And the possible reason for this might be that these beans contain lectins. Now, what are lectins? Lectins are protein substances that bind to carbohydrate and are generally larger in structure and not as digestible as your soluble fiber produce. In terms of AD and cancer prevention, beans and peanuts are at the top of this category. Kidney beans, pinto beans, black beans, lima beans, etc. Now, you may hear some controversy about lectins in terms of gluten intolerance. Gluten is in the lectin category. In my opinion, and again, this is my opinion, the problem is not so much the lectin as much as it is the leaky gut. The leaky gut could be caused by a bunch of things. And again, I had a whole podcast on that. I'll see if I can find it and link it. And this leaky gut causes large molecules like gluten to get through to the blood. And speaking of controversy, there's been some talk that soybeans can be a problem because they might make too many estrogens. Soy contains phytoestrogens, which may not be the same as estrogens. We might have a problem with excess estrogens in our body, but most experts don't believe that soy is the source of that problem. Number six, dark chocolate. Now, for a lot of women, this is their drug of choice. Well, okay, maybe that and pot brownies. Dark chocolate has gotten attention because it has polyphenols, and polyphenols is a type of antioxidant. One of the things it might do, these substances in dark chocolate is that it may relax arteries. 
This may help reduce inflammation in the tiny hairline arteries in the brain. I'll give you a link to an article that discusses this whole issue of whether or not we can call chocolate a healthy food. Number seven, coffee. Now there's been some talk around the coffee pot about whether or not coffee may be beneficial. And the reason that was proposed is that it helps increase something called cyclic AMP, which helps memory. That's not necessarily important. And thus far, it hasn't been proven. So go ahead and have a cup of coffee, but don't let it interfere with your sleep. Supposedly, it takes about six hours for the caffeine to leave your system. Number eight. In terms of vitamins specifically, the three that they mention in terms of possibly reducing the risk of Alzheimer's disease are vitamin D, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12. And also vitamin E, as I mentioned before, because it's an antioxidant. Now, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that deficiencies in vitamin B6 and B12 in particular can actually act in an adversarial way if you want to prevent or delay the onset of AD. So adequate B6 and B12 is important. Number nine. The last of the good stuff I want to mention is turmeric. Turmeric is definitely the spice du jour, and with good reason, apparently. Turmeric in a good quality source of vitamin D together can fight the plaque that accumulates in the brain when someone is developing AD. Okay, that's for the good stuff. Now for the things that you may want to reduce or eliminate if you want to prevent AD or slow down the process. Number one, processed meats. And by this I mean hot dogs, bologna, pepperoni, etc. I bet you had a feeling that this would be near the top of the list. As I mentioned in my previous podcast on Alzheimer's disease, a lot of food-related risk factors sound a lot like those for cardiovascular or heart disease. Common sense tells us that most people may not be willing to give up meat altogether, so the recommendation is generally that if you have meat on a regular basis, try getting hormone-free and preferably organic. And if you can cut down on meat consumption by say one night a week, that's certainly beneficial. Number two, the next thing on the foods to reduce list are eggs, a high quantity of eggs, high fat dairy, and saturated fats in general. These are on the list of things you may want to reduce. And some people say it's better to avoid them altogether, but we know common sense rules apply here. And then again, basically, the heart disease rule applies. If these foods help prevent cardiovascular disease, they may help prevent Alzheimer's disease. If you think about your artery as being a pipe and you start to occlude or close the opening to that pipe, then you get less circulation and less blood flow with oxygen going to your brain. Number three, fish containing higher levels of mercury. In terms of the benefits of fish versus meats, In smaller amounts, the risk might not outweigh the benefits. But not everyone agrees with that opinion. And by the large fish, we mean tuna and swordfish and the like. Wild-caught salmon should be okay. Ditto for flounder, sole, tilapia, bass, and catfish. Number four, soda. I'm giving this its own category. This is one category that I think it's safe to say we can eliminate. Number five excessive sugar. The theory here in terms of its relationship to Alzheimer's disease is this. Excess glucose around the cells causes inflammation, and this inflammation can lead to changes in the hippocampus. This hippocampus is the part of the brain that's responsible for memory, and this is where, in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's disease, the plaques and tangles accumulate. When it comes to blood glucose, the rate of the increase or spike in the blood glucose level is important. In other words, if we can spread the glucose curve so that it flattens over a longer period of time, it's better. How do you do that? With fiber, of course. How do you get fiber? With all of the stuff in the first list, of course. Now, this might all seem like a big fat da, but it's actually only been in the past 10 years that all of this data with this evidence is coming out. We now know what increases the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. 
and we know it decreases the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Can we fix this overnight? Well, no, of course not. But I'd like to leave you with two thoughts. Until recently, Alzheimer's disease was a rare occurrence, which means it could be rare again. And related to that, memory loss is not a necessary part of aging. If we could get a pillow and embroider that on a pillow, that would be great. The second thing I'd like to say is that we can always improve the brain we have. We now know that contrary to popular belief, we can increase our brain cells and our neurological connections. So that's some food for thought. That's all I have for you today. Be well and stay tuned next week for another episode of Healing Outside the Box.